Um, first of all, uh, I'm uh, I'm very pleased to have been working with the MMI program and having had the opportunity to do the journey for the last few years and uh, learn a lot by this. And I'm going to uh, to do this uh, fancy presentation for you. Well, try to explain a little about how it was all about enhancing the competitiveness through improving innovation. And uh, to quote uh, a famous uh, strategist, uh, or almost quote or paraphrase it, did culture eat strategy for breakfast? And I can safely say uh, that you'll get my take on this, but it's for my, um, for my part as well. Uh, but what we are tapping into eventually, and keep that in mind, it's actually several years of research prior to the MMI program by Kellogg Innovation and so on, and a lot of academics from world-class universities who's been working with this, and it's all the cumulative experience from those 100 companies uh, working with this in collaboration also with the, uh, with the consultants. So I think we have a, a immense mountain of wealth in terms of knowledge here that really uh, is worth uh, um, thinking about. And uh, I know I have the tough assignment here, uh, getting you all after lunch. Uh, so uh, in order to avoid you guys sleeping, I'd like to do a little exercise with me. So could you please, I know it's a tough one, but you, could you please stand up, everyone? And I have a simple challenge to you. It is very, very simple, but it's about culture. Would you please close your eyes, all of you? Keep them closed. And now take your right index finger and stretch your arm and point towards true north. And keep your eyes closed. Everyone, yeah, we are getting there. Everyone pointing north. Okay, when you're damn sure you're pointing north, then you can open your eyes, everyone, and take a look around. Okay, you got the first part of the exercise right. Okay, please, you can sit down again. Imagine what happens in a Scandinavian company, a Nordic company, a multinational company. We need to be innovative. All right, this is going to be fun. I mean, North is easy, isn't it? Innovate. That's t uh, slightly more difficult. And that's a huge challenge. And the next step, so some of you are engineers, are techie dudes, but some of you are Norwegians, uh, and maybe both, uh, but also know about nature. How would you go about solving where is true North from here? Smart asses get their phones, grab them out, and start using the compass. Yes, I know that one. Had there been windows, someone from Denmark would have started looking out and looking at the trees and saying, okay, yeah, there's uh, some green stuff on the trees on this side. This means uh, this is uh, west, uh, this must be east. And, and uh, the, uh, the true believer would look, uh, be, would always know where Mecca is, and uh, someone would know, would know where the church towers are. The point being, we would solve that, most likely, diff different, each of us. So, I would like to do a little more exercise, but you can sit down still. Uh, I would like you to say hello to someone of a different nationality who is sitting next to you. And I'd like you to tell that person, in my country, we are unique, or we have some special characteristic, because we are really good at, and make it something about being from the country you're from. Please spend one minute together with someone next to you from a different country.
Okay, time up. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you realize now from the sound of your voices that every country has something it's good at. I bet every country unfortunately also has something that they're really bad at and we won't dwell on that today. But I would like to, to take me uh, with, with, you, with you here on a journey. This is how France looks at the rest of Europe, allegedly. A dear friend of mine sent this to me and I simply had to use this one. So you can see in uh, Denmark we brewed Vikings uh, I mean, that's wishful thinking, really, because it was a Dane who wrote this one. But uh, in Sweden, it's meatball eaters, and in Norway, people who love cold water, and it used to be uh, weather, sorry. Uh, and in uh, Finland, it's uh, cell phone makers. In uh, Iceland, it's simply too cold. Uh, well, it's actually, yeah. And uh, yeah, you can see, and in, in Holland, it's weed, and German is best friends, and so on. And it's like, uh, definitely not Europeans, mo noisy, hairy people. They're not, not, I mean, we have all our prejudices, and this is from France, right? Okay, let's take a journey onwards to Germany. Eiffelreich, Ikea, here it rains too much. Still cell phone makers, and uh, still the brood Vikings, it's still a Dane who made it. So, and this Altes Nachtbahner, uh, old neighbors. So there are some, uh, <coughs> yeah, obviously Russia is a gas vault, and uh, there's a gas transit land, and here we have the, the workforce source, and the schnapps country, and vampire land in between. So, prejudice we can find everywhere, and I think some of it, is, it rings a little true, but it's like, uh, yeah, cheap hotels here, and it's nice and warm. <laughs> Finally, we have the Italians. Uh, what do they think about this? Obviously, we are in Volvo land. And uh, Hyperborea, the, the, the land be, be beyond the north wind, where the, when the Greek mythology, the uh, mythology, the, uh, the people who always have sunshine lives, it must be up there, right? And still cell phone makers, I mean, uh, that was sort of cemented some years ago, I guess. And we have the uh, Wembley Stadium and uh, uh, Italian di dialects and so on, yeah, right. And for uh, still the Gazprom area. This is uh, kindly provided by the Danish tri Trade Council, by the way, but, uh, so who put it at my uh, disposal here. I would like to ask you guys, if you could raise your hand, how, m how many of you have been involved in trying to sell, deliver and invoice a product or service to another Nordic country? Okay, that's about half or maybe two thirds even. So, how many have been involved, have tried to sell invoice or deliver projects to at least two Nordic countries? Okay, that's, we're still about a, li a little few. And three Nordic countries? Okay, we're getting less here, so it's like, uh, and if we say four, that's only a very select few. And if we say five, Okay, you're lying. That's a test. <laughs> anyway, the point being, such a simple thing as invoicing across borders, do you know how it works? Do I, if I send an invoice to Norway or to Denmark from Sweden, would I need to put VAT on it? Oh, that's, oh that can become difficult, really. And it's such a th simple thing, and we are talking about innovation. Gee, we don't even know how to sell stuff abroad, ac across borders if we don't take care. So the point being, obviously we can have say, uh, say that, yes, other people do this for us, but it's also about knowing how stuff works that will make it easier for you to navigate in this and to create business opportunities. One thing I learned from this was how much language means the whole MMI project. You wouldn't believe, or maybe some of you remember still, but all the dialogue that was about, okay, what is the language going to be? in these workshops, in the questionnaire to be sent out to all the companies. Oh no, we cannot use it because if we don't get it in our local language, it won't work. Simply, people will misinterpret it, they won't be able to answer it. And the inventors of the uh, MMI program or the innovation rate, they, they said, yeah, well, we will have a hard time analyzing it and understanding it if you don't provide it in English for us. That's a huge issue and languages are a barrier. 
it's a serious barrier. That's why we're talking English here. I've been working in Stockholm for a, for a number of years by now, and I realize if I, I if I have an important discussion, I need to take it in English. I speak fairly okay, passable uh, Swedish. I believe I understand almost all Swedish, but if I'm not understood, then I'm in trouble. If I'm selling a service or trying to... Uh, mediate a conflict or whatever it might be. So I would say it's really, really uh, important. And one thing we learned from the MMI project, if you look across the workshops in the uh, in, held in the Nordics, it was actually many of the same challenges we faced. This is why I, I how to say, say that the framework is robust, because we actually experienced exactly, I'd not say not exactly, but pretty much the same challenges, despite of our differences across the Scandinavian uh, countries. You know we are different. I mean, Danes, they are brood and direct and don't respect the uh, contracts uh, necessarily, and the Swedes, they love them, uh, and the procedures and the authorities uh, about it. The Norwegians, they are they're indomitable, and they, they, will, uh, they will walk home early, uh, but they will be quite happy. And the Finns will uh, work very, very uh, hard on stuff, uh, but you won't hear them talk about uh, much before you actually get some results and i must confess i'm not very professed professed in the, uh, in, the in working with uh, icelanders but i'm uh, i'm sure of one thing that it's it's hard to understand as finishes which is why i conclude this but some of my experiences from this uh, this wonderful journey here let's see initially Believe it or not, now we know it works, but it was a huge challenge for those stakeholders that are funding the program or the, and the consult consultants who are part of this to actually find companies that would be able and willing to work with improving their innovation. And uh, let me uh, focus on this one for a second. We are really, really busy right now, aren't we? Uh, <clears throat> I hate to say it, but yesterday in the Danish newspapers, we had a uh, rather unfortunate uh, front page on the leading business magazine, like the Danish, as Jörn said, uh, the Danish uh, innovation uh, policy, uh, innovation results on a disaster course. Um, I would have liked uh, more Danish companies to be present today, I can tell you that for sure, but uh, maybe next time. The thing is, organizations under pressure, as everyone has been during the recent crisis, often struggle with resources for, for strategic initiatives. And very often it ends up with incremental innovation. We do a little improvements and we do what we call rip off and duplicate. That is what our new R&D function is efficiently doing. Um, I would dare to claim that MMI, with the innovation rate I approach, actually offered something different with a huge potential for impact. And I'm so glad to see some of the participating uh, companies today having actually experienced that and maybe taking it further. I'm very curious to see what comes of it later on. Um, so, as an MMI consultant and deep dive facilitator, I had the pleasure to experience some really good things that are the green ones. You can, you can clearly read them up here. I had also some challenges, which you can see are the yellow ones. And then if any of you should ever use this, I really recommend you to think about this. So let's take a look at it. So it was a world-class framework, a complete questionnaire with workshop and training package. It wasn't that hard to learn to use. Once you get the, got the hang of it, you could actually also see that it was results-oriented as opposed to process-oriented. Danes love that. Other companies or other countries also like that um, since it also, also caters for the process. And then it was a very rare opportunity to test leading-edge research that actually turned out to work really great. One of the challenges I experienced with almost every single workshop when I introduced the Innovation Rate of Framework is that skeptics can be really, really hard to convince initially. And you need the C-level, the chief something, executive officer, or chief sales officer, uh, or something from the C-level to be present simply as a prerequisite for success. Otherwise, you won't get any follow-up actions or any funding or any time attention uh, for this and as a consultant or workshop facilitator it is actually quite crucial that you understand the uh, client's business model or are able to get that understanding really quickly and then this uh, this thing with quarterly miracles often working against the uh, longer term initiatives 
Uh, someone might think that this is a uh, this temporary situation. There's no better time to innovate than one year ago, because then we would have new services on the market tomorrow, right? Uh, but right now is not a good time. We'll wait until next year. Isn't that better? Uh -uh. Get used to it. This is a new normal. This is where we need to live and simply breathe we need to be able to work within the constraints because they're not going to change much more. Rather, they're going to be more of a tight straight jacket. So something that I really made some notes about, explain the innovation rate of framework with local examples that are local to the country or some, some generic examples that you can find and relate to for each of the participants. Make sure everyone understands it and actually takes ownership, have them explain some of it themselves so you verify that they understand the 12 dimensions, or at least the four dimensions. And then uh, <clears throat> there's a little story, many of you probably know it, um, about follow-up. The difference between being involved versus being committed, right? If you make bacon and eggs, the chicken is very well involved, yes, but the pig is committed. So make sure people are committed in your uh, activities. This presentation will, by the way, be online if you need to. So you, you don't need to make a lot of pictures of, of the presentation. Um, so what I've been able to listen and uh, how to say synthesize from what I've heard from the companies, uh, I would like to share with you as well. Um, so if we say the uh, it has actually been for some companies an opportunity to enhance the playing field. And as more people have said today, it's a strong visualization for developing a shared understanding. Um, and obviously, the example I just gave you, everyone innovate. Haha, uh aha. -huh. Okay, everyone run north, right? That'll be fun. That'll take us with the shotgun approach all the way, uh, all around the circus, right? Um, so getting the shared understanding also is an efficiency experience an uh, e efficiency action that makes sure that you get quicker to the uh, desired situation. Uh, the ability to track development over time and something which can be used and adopted for both short term within the current quarter, as some of the, uh, the participating companies mentioned uh, even, and then a long term strategic approach as well. I had the pleasure to follow uh, some companies, uh, one uh, namely uh, Snowcastle Interactive, a tiny startup, a game, company, a game construction company, an edutainment construction company, um, in the, uh, doing uh, applications and so for mobile devices. And uh, I could, uh, we could actually see the whole life cycle changing from the offering towards the customer experience, towards the value capture. And there's a life cycle dimension when you look into the innovation rate as well. And those of you who have been hinting at it today, it's, it's quite right. You see this especially with the young companies. So some of the challenges, we are so busy trying to be innovative in many ways. We even have another program in place and we really have no time to look at other methods. Well, you'll have to cut, come past that hurdle if you want to use it. Um, and another hurdle, um, do we have any resources to follow up on whatever changes we identify from this? This is why you need the sea level uh, engagement and participation, because otherwise you definitely won't have that. Finally, Again, make sure that everyone understands the priorities and take ownership. Use some exercises. In the workshops, we used a methodology where we actually took the renovation radar on a, on a whiteboard and then said, OK, draw your com best three competitors profile, but don't take the best three. Take the one that's most annoying. Take the, the one that's most cool. Take the one that, that is the most inspiration for you guys and then put them up here and then learn from them. So that way you can use examples as an active part of the facilitation as well. And by making sure that everyone understands this, uh, make sure that it's actually communicated in the organization. So you have the principle of one message, many voices. We want to innovate in the value capture dimension, or we want to innovate in the customer uh, needs dimension. And as you said, Hans Christian, the, yes, it might take some time to turn the whole ship around, and there might be stuff that needs to be done, but 
once you start orchestrating this with one message and many voices, you will get there eventually. And instead of the total chaos, if everyone was told to run north, I still don't know where it is though. Um, so these were examples of from some from from some uh, competitor profiles that we uh, we wrote in here, and. Uh, yeah, they work quite well, and uh, I hope that Nordic Innovation will uh, put it up somewhere. Uh, otherwise, I can tell that one of the companies that I had the pleasure to work with, Symphonical, which is on later today, is hopefully putting it on as a uh, as a service on their uh, on their web service, which is free. And I hope to it remains that way, so I won't be accused of doing a commercial here. But I think it, some of it might be available for for others to use uh, in a very uh, easy way in their website. So this was a, a little journey about the Nordic culture in relation to the MMI process. I learned a lot. And just to, to give you a last example, a last story. Uh, my son who was uh, 11 years old. He's uh, at an international school. And uh, he's not, how to say, he's not tainted by the, uh, by the country specificness yet. Not, at, not so visible at least. So when they had their uh, their, their autumn break uh, trip to somewhere in southern Sweden, some very very nice, and he was sharing a room with another guy from his school, from the same class group. Uh, he spent three days with, uh, with that guy in the, and sharing that room, and they were running around every, all of the kids. And when he came home, he he knew that he his name was Thomas. And I asked him, Nikola, what nationality were your uh, were your roommate? And he looked at me, that. I have no idea. Does it matter? The message here being, it's a mindset, and it's your mindset. And it might not necessarily be that you will solve the problem of finding true north in here because of your nationality. It might also be because you're a techie dude. Uh, it, it might be because you are a fisherman and you know stuff about directions. Uh, it might be because you're creative and do whatever or look at the, the clock. Uh, the point being that there are new how to say, communities across the world, so to say, that unites us. And that might be a, a much bigger challenge in the future to address as well. But that was about it. I would say uh, thank you for listening to me and I hope you got some uh, inspiration. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure participating in this and this one will be put online on the website as well so you can distribute it. So how did you go on the clock there? I actually managed to go eight minutes under time, but you eight told minutes over time. It's ra rather unusual, but perfect. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, Christian Mikkelsen, give him a hand, and we will have the next panel debate coming up shortly. So I think you also will get a gift. It's Christmas coming up, so. Thank you. Thank you.